This has been an awful winter. Bitter cold temperatures, seemingly never-ending snowstorms. Some of us have been fortunate in being able to cope with trips to places like the Bahamas or Mexico. But for those of us unfortunate enough to be left behind, there is only that hope that spring will come soon. It was that hope which drew us this morning to Gobbler's Knob in Punxsutawney to see Phil, the forecasting groundhog. Each of us assembled with the desire the furry critter would not see his shadow, thereby signaling nearly the end of winter. Apprehensively, we gathered, waiting for Phil to make his entrance. Finally, Punxsutawney Groundhog Club President David Earhart and his group of weather scouts appeared. Earhart summoned the great seer of seers from his warm burrow. In seconds, it was over. Phil had made his forecast in the language known only to a few. I have now the information to communicate with Bunsen Phil, and he has spoken groundhog ease to me. His Imperial Majesty King Philip, the only true weather prophet, emerged from his snow-covered burrow at 727 this morning. The king of all weather prognosticators braved the blasts of cold wintry air only long enough to cast a noticeably long gray shadow. Earhart held us in suspense. Would we soon be basking in the warm sun, or would we have more of the bitter cold like we had this morning? Thus, it is official. There will be six more weeks of winter weather, but the worst, friends, is over. I can tell you we were shocked and disappointed, but there was little we could do. For Phil, classed as the king of weather prophets, Lord High Potentate of all Marmata Monas and Weejack Extraordinary had spoken. All we could do was bundle up and move sadly away into the cold morning. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the road in Punxsutawney. For most people, retirement means spending the rest of their years in some sun-drenched portion of these United States. But not for Edith Schumann. For her, retirement meant simply staying home, about a quarter mile up this road, just outside of Lopez. A friend of mine lives out in, in um, the west, and she wants me to sell out and come out to make my home with her and uh, in Arizona. And uh, she thinks she has it made out there, but I just can't see myself parting with all the things that have meant a lot to me over my life, you know. What means a lot to Edith is acres of land with a view for miles. Memories of years teaching in Sullivan County. Memories of a house built over a hundred years ago. But there is more here than memory. Edith has friends. And twice each day, she takes the walk to the family barn to say hello. 61 sheep, including two new arrivals, three horses, and assorted chickens make their home here. Edith cares for them herself because she can't get anyone else and because she loves animals. All this is not really surprising, for in Edith Schumann, one finds that rare spirit, a spirit which leads her to make do for herself. This is Jeep country, and um, that's the way I travel. And where a Jeep can't go, it's pretty bad. And if the Jeep fails, Edith has been known to take to horse or snowshoe. Edith is independent. But she still remembers the old days when a neighbor's friendship was cherished, when help was a holler away. I think that that sociability and the concern of the welfare of all your friends isn't what it used to be. And I think that's one of the things I miss, mm -hmm. is that, that spirit of cooperation that, that uh, I don't think it exists because I don't think you know who your neighbors are anymore to have that concern about their welfare. Independent part-time farmer Edith Schumann plans to keep doing what she's doing as long as she can. When she's finished with the land, plans are for the acreage to go to the state. Edith says that way the land will give to many the enjoyment it gave to her. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the road in Lopez. You know, traveling the road in northeastern Pennsylvania, one finds a lot of interesting and unusual things. And that's pretty much what I found about two miles up this road at Camp Town. Welcome to Camp Valabay, a summer camp run by Jerry and Dottie Janone. Nothing unusual, you say? Agreed, but look closely on that tree. There they are. 
At this point, you might be inclined, as I was, to ask the nature of the fowl. Guinea hen, says Jerry, used by some folk as watchbirds. Many farmers have them keep them in the uh, chicken house so that uh, if any prowling animals come around, they'll warn the farmer in letting out this terrible squawk. Not of singular talent, these birds. We'd been warned if the weather was nice, they might be out on their constitutional when we arrived. Something done with clockwork regularity while summer guests tour Camp Balabay. Oh, and what's this I hear of the crew appearing at Jerry and Dottie's window in the morning, as if prompting an early rise and early breakfast? They come and tap on the window and wake us up in the morning. They do spend the bulk of their time, though, in the tree. The rest of the time, they uh, kind of like to look at themselves in the reflection of the glass. They're really not waking us up. <laughs> okay, scratch the wake up, but this watchbird thing had me interested. So far, though, I'd seen no demonstration. Cold, Jerry says. It's too cold for us, too cold for them. Come on, Jerry, can't they do something? Give it one try. <laughs> hey, what's the matter? Come on. <laughs> okay, now a frontal attack. Well, Jerry tried and failed, so we had to leave, keeping in the air, so to speak, the ponderous question of the guinea hen's use as protector of home and hearth. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the road in Camp Town. It is difficult to drive by the home of Henry Pascavage in Frackville and miss the 20-foot totem pole that stands in his backyard. But when you find out that he carved it himself, it is even more difficult to go by without stopping for a visit. Henry works in a garage cluttered with a stock of his trade. His stock is something which to us is merely a piece of wood, an inanimate object. But to Henry, it is more. There's life if you're willing to look for it. Wood itself, it has uh, qualities that uh, something else other could paint. You almost have to feel it to, uh, to get the uh, actual uh, uh, fullness out of the piece of wood here. For eight years, since Henry changed his profession of teacher to woodcarver, he's been finding those things which lie in a block of wood. A friendship cane under the length of black willow, a more complicated communion frame from red oak. And what of a piece of sugar pine? You have to make something long, so if you want to make a, so, uh, either uh, a long uh, stylized bird or uh, thickness, about the same size, uh, good, good enough for a bird of this size. Yeah, so. One of Henry's finest achievements is in his church, St. John the Baptist, a huge cross and a relief of the Last Supper that took perhaps 300 hours of work to finish. But Henry dreams of more, something to show his roots and background in the coal region here. <laughs> There's a lot of big ideas for, uh, for carving. But I like to carve a, a, a big coal miner. That's really a, almost a full-size coal miner out of, uh, out of uh, wood. Uh, the same way uh, uh, with the coal uh, theme, I worked at a uh, coal mines, uh, drove truck around it and uh, did a lot of work here so I know a little about it. Henry Pascavage, the envy of all of us who can barely whittle, an artist who creates something from nothing. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Frackville. Dent takes the folks out. He's been known to do it in style, and what you're watching is nothing new in Light Street. It could be any Sunday, it could be time for the Bloomsburg Fair, or it could just be that Alan decided to go for a ride. Alan Dent and his family own a lot of cars like those, including this 1931 Model A, complete with rumble seat. For he and his sons Buster and Neil operate an antique car museum. Inside you'll find more Model A's, some Model T's, the popular first model Mustang, and the not-so-popular Edsel. Most valuable among them, a 1924 Lincoln. How could one resist a ride in a car with its own flower holders, a cigarette lighter, 
a tilt steering wheel, and of course, a clock for the busy executive. Allen bought it for $250. The car was complete, but the motor was dismantled, and I had a real old mechanic go over the engine and put it back together, and that was back in the early 50s. And at that time, the car wasn't worth much, but I had turned down $20,000 for it. Alan Dent's been at the car collecting business since 1948. Like most hobbies, it started simply enough. Ever since I was a kid, I used to ride on my brother's Model A Roadster and Copes and stuff, so I always thought I wanted to have one, too. And so I just started collecting them, that was all, I guess. First, first old one I bought was the 26 Ford Touring, which you've seen down there, which we still have. Families all rode in it and brought all the kids into the world in it. In 30 years, you pick up a lot of stories about cars, and you learn to look for parts in unusual places. Well, that was on a tractor that I paid $25 for. What kind of grill was it? That was the 32 Rio Flying Cloud. I paid $25 for the tractor, and we sold the grill for $150. Alan Dent and his family and their cars out of the past. His museum, a trip backward to the good old days. The days when your new car could be any color, as long as it was black. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Light Street. I'd heard tell Carl Howell Jr. of New Albany was a turkey caller, so I thought I'd see for myself. His call, two straws taped together, seemed a bit unconventional, but his theory of a couple yelps and gobbles once in a while seemed sound enough. The idea is to initiate turkey activity so that they come into you, okay? And uh, sometimes it can be done with one or two yelps, and a gobbler will answer you, or you have to sit there and wait, and then they'll sneak up behind you and scare you to death. <laughs> So we picked a hill Carl thought would work, right between a cornfield and a roosting spot. Okay, so what if it is a damp, dismal day? Carl knows the woods. By his own admission, he called in a half dozen last year. So we began. No answer. Our confidence diminishes a bit. Carl, maybe the pitch isn't right, or maybe more gobble than yelp. Well, disillusioned, we headed out of the woods, our chilled bones wanting nothing more than hot coffee. But Carl, what really happened? Um, we're not in the right spot. <clears throat> what do you mean we're not in the right spot? Uh, we're here and the turkeys aren't. <laughs> okay. All I can say to that is what every fisherman who has ever wet a line or every hunter who has ever walked a field has said, maybe next time. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in New Albany. A plowed farmer's field. How many of us have driven by one without even giving it a thought? Not so in Dauphin County. Well, there are some fellows who take their plowing seriously rounds on the upper and lower boundaries of his plot. The short fur should be plowed as part of the main fur. The rules are simple. Plow a 50 by 60 foot parcel of ground in a contour fashion, skipping imaginary waterways and ending as neatly as if a comb had been pulled across the land. Doing it is obviously not a job for beginners. You're, you got to be a, an operator before you get into this kind of competition. Uh, it's not directly, we're not directly uh, working all together as a competitive end on it. We're trying to improve the techniques of doing a better job of plowing. The ground is ready. The judges are ready. The drivers are too. So let the competition begin. You can adjust that plow and that piece of equipment that it's going to uh, work the way the, the rules are set up on your regulations that you're going to work from. Finally, the dust has settled. The judges begin adding up the points. 
20 here for the finish furrow, 10 there for trash cover, 20 or so for pulverization. Morris, do you think you did well? I didn't do. I'm, I'm not uh, in the, the top ranking. I'm along the, the bottom line on it. And Morris did not do well this day, ranking third in the field of four. Ah, well, such are the fortunes of battle. Take heart, Morris. There's still the opportunity to practice on all that spring plowing at home. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Elizabethville. The Susquehanna River runs from the northern border of Pennsylvania to the state's southern border. You can drive its entire length. You can cross it on any number of bridges. But only in Millersburg can you go over the Susquehanna in a truly unique fashion. Welcome aboard the Falcon. Your crew today is second mate Jonah, first mate George Motter, and your captain is Jack Dillman. The route is the same today as it's been for years, one mile across the Susquehanna from Millersburg to Crow's Landing on the West Bank. Your trip should take maybe 15 minutes or so. There's never any real hurry here. I have seen people come aboard who had been driven, you know, say they'd been driving down from New England as an illustration. And they were so shaken up from being behind the wheel that you could visibly see them unwind as they went across. And uh, this is one of the things that the hurry does best. Be careful on this trip, for you're on one of only four passenger stern wheel paddle boats in this country. And if you don't watch yourself, you'll begin seeing Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer hunkered down alongside a campfire on the west bank. The Falcon brings out the romantic in us all, even Captain Jack. There's a charm to it. It's something that it's hard to describe. You have to feel it. You can possibly go there more quickly than I can take you. But here you have a chance to relax, to see the beauty of this river, which you never will be able to from a highway bridge. And, uh, well, whether you like it or whether you don't, you will have no choice but to slow down. These things don't travel very lively, and really more of us should slow down once in a while. The Millersburg to Crow's Landing Paddle Wheel Ferry. Not a mover by today's standards, except maybe backward, if you use your imagination enough. And in these days of 55 mile an hour speed limits, never enough time to do anything, and a longing for the good old days, maybe that's not such a bad trip. Well, back to the realities of macadam and concrete roads, and on to the faster pace of an auction in Bradford County. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Millersburg, Dauphin County. Fifty people have come to Bloomsburg this week. Their purpose in being here to make music. Music with bells. They are at the Area 2 Festival of the American Guild of English Handbell Ringers at Bloomsburg State College. They're here to play their particular style of music and to learn from people like director Bill Payne. There's been a series of mini concerts by the bell ringers since the festival opened Wednesday. The conclusion comes Friday night. And the nearly 1,200 ringers will gather in a full concert at the Nelson Field House of Bloomsburg State. We'll take a closer look at the people who make music with bells in another report next week. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Bloomsburg. Jameson City, Pennsylvania. Population? Oh, not that many. But it calls itself the fun capital of the world. And what would the fun capital of the world be like without a good old-fashioned 4th of July parade? A group of people decided that it was the 4th of July, and they just wanted to walk up the road and wave flags and have a little parade. And that, basically, was the way the annual Jameson City Parade began five years ago. Today's was bigger than ever. Columbia County 4-H'ers, Benton Color Guard, a couple of floats. Still evident was the problem of spectators and participants. 
Again this year, it was solved handily. We just kind of divided everybody up, and, and the ones that really wanted to be in the parade, of course, could be in the parade. And the ones that, um, you know, w wanted to watch it, why, why they're here watching it. Getting into the spirit of things, we joined in the parade, too. After all, half the instruments in the band were gone. They still had the drum, but the horn wasn't there. It, it was uh, dropped. I, maybe they felt that there was too, uh, too many instruments. All kidding aside, the Jameson City 4th of July parade was not unlike other celebrations this day in our country. A little disorganized, maybe, a little less glamorous, but still an expression by people of a small town that they were willing to celebrate our nation's birthday in their own way and have fun doing it. Mike Stevens, News Watch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Jameson City. Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in New Columbus. Each year about this time, in the course of a week, 200 or so cars are driven up for blessing by Monsignor Agnello Angelini. It's a tradition started here in 1933 by the Monsignor. In 1938, he quit driving. I felt that I had not enough means of transportation to get around. Furthermore, after I was escaped death two or three times, I didn't want to take a chance anymore. I felt that as long as I can get around by train or bus or public car to people can help me out there, I can get around and do my work and get away sometimes for a visit up home or a day off. But he gets around all right by foot when he must, sometimes in a car driven by a parishioner or other friend. Over the years, he's developed a reputation as the hitchhiking Monsignor. Anyone who's ever thumbed a ride knows hitching can be a problem, but not for Monsignor Angelini, who puts his faith in God and the last car in line. So the next time you're passing through the New Columbus, Nesquehoning area, and you happen to see a man about 79 years old wearing the collar of a priest, you might want to offer a ride. If it is Monsignor Angelini, you may get more for your trouble than just a pleasant conversation. Mike Stevens, Newswatch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in New Columbus. The tractor, a basic tool of the American farmer. Basic. But did you ever wonder what happens if you modify one just a bit? you might end up with is something with giant tires, a couple engines burning anything from airplane fuel to alcohol, and cranking out to the tune of 700 to 1200 horses. In short, not the thing to plow the South 40 with, but definitely something which every weekend or so you could haul off to a combination drag race, gab session, story swapping, socially beneficial meeting called the heaviest show on earth, a tractor pull. Woody Flowers does, answering the call of the engines from his home in Lancaster County. Yeah, I went to a tractor pull, uh, tractor pull national up at Hughesville, and uh, when I was there, my wife says, that's what we ought to have. Two weeks later, there we had a local pool down home, and this is a tractor I had at the local pool. Okay. I had an old M at home, and I just tore the engine out of it and put an automobile, 427 Chevy, in it, and I started from there, and ever since, we're in tractor pulling. That's about nine years now. For Woody and men and women like him, the field of battle was here, a ring in the fairgrounds at Newfoundland. Their opponent, a 28-ton rig that'll fight a tractor every foot of the way until, huffing and puffing and smoking, the tractor spins out and the contest ends. Woody didn't do so well this day, but for him there is the philosophical view that winning isn't always important competing is. My mind is to come and have fun. Have fun and make the people happy and enjoy the pools that I go to. I, I enjoy the people howling and cheering for me and this is, this is the reason I'm going. I'm just a happy-go-lucky fellow. <laughs> well, for the tractor pullers, there'll always be another pull. Probably next weekend. Somewhere. Somewhere where there is the dust, the smoke, the crowds, and the deafening noise of the engines. They'll tell you all of it gets into your blood. 
Mike Stevens, News Watch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Wayne County. The masters of prestidigitation had gathered for the annual Magicians Alliance of Eastern States Convention. Here were the trappings of a trade, the things that mystify us, that make us ask, how did he do that? You could even get impromptu performances by the likes of Bob Little. How did he do that? In another room, you could learn at least some of the answers, for part of the convention's purpose was to teach, using the likes of Tom Ogden. Tom, a few years back, graduated from Penn State with a drama and English major, but decided his future was in the mysterious world of magic. His definition of what he does is deeper than sleight of hand. To me, magic would be the, uh, the combination of illusion as one form in reality and being able to combine those two so that to the average person it looks that what, what you're doing is real. Magic for me today is, the, is not the ability just to fool a person. Uh, it's the ability to let a person forget what should actually be happening. And if they have no explanation, and they're still entertained at the same time without your challenging them to try and figure out how it's done, then you've created magic. And create it he does. So well, in fact, it makes you wonder, how did he do that? Mike Stevens, News Watch 16, on the Pennsylvania Road in Reading. This were your card, the uh, six of clubs.